Alrighty, folks. Good afternoon. Welcome in. Uh, hello, everybody. On behalf of Force Space, welcome. Great to see you here. Welcome to the first keynote in this week of discussions uh, dedicated to sustainability and climate change for this event. Nina Matthews will lead us through the implications of the remaining carbon budget for climate policies and emissions targets. Just uh, to let you know, those of you who aren't familiar with us, Concordia University's Force Space is located in downtown Jojage, Montreal, on unceded indigenous land. We are, in fact, a physical space in, on campus whereby we collaborate with our community to make research um, initiatives or course activities publicly accessible through any number of interactive experiences. So we're very pleased to collaborate here, making this uh, week of discussion kind of happen virtually. We are recording this event and we are live streaming at CU Force Space. So I'll put those links in the chat as soon as I'm speaking, as soon as, as soon as I'm done speaking, excuse me. You're more than welcome to join in the conversation today by sharing any thoughts and comments in the chat throughout. That's why it's open for you. Please choose the panelists and attendees option from the pull down menu as you make your comments, just so we can all see them. And if you would be so kind to make uh, Jim Grant's life a little bit easier for the, for the moderation section, if you have actual uh, questions that you'd like Damon to address during a Q&A, please pop those into the Q&A box proper. That would be awesome. Also, if you prefer to speak, you're more than welcome to raise your little virtual hand and we will unmute you so that you can ask your question orally. Okay, on that note, it's my uh, pleasure to pass the floor over to you, Jim, welcome. Thank you, Anna, and thank you to Fourth Space for co-hosting our fourth annual Sustainability Cross Disciplines Conference. Um, I'm here as you know, a principal of Loyola College for Diversity and Sustainability and co-director of the Loyola Sustainability Research Center. And it's uh, uh, my delight to invite you to attend uh, all week, a week of discussion about climate change. Um, even though we're in a pandemic now, I think we can't uh, forget that climate change is there, it's waiting for us, it's still the most pressing issue that faces us today and for the foreseeable future. Well, welcome to our third event of our first day. Um, when we began planning this event um, on climate change, of course, Rebecca, me, others said we first have to book David Matthews because we we have to book Damon and then we can build our program around him because he is the face of climate change research at Concordia University. He's a professor in our own Department of Geography, Planning and Environment. He's a Concordia Research Chair in Climate Science and Sustainability. And if you don't know much about him, he, he's a rock star of the international science community. He published regularly in Science and Nature and lots of other prestigious journals. So we are delighted that he's here to kick off the week with our first uh, big lecture, plenary lecture, and his title is Implications of the Remaining Carbon Budget for Climate Policies and Emissions Targets. So Damon, please take it away. Well, thank you. Thank you, Jim, for that very kind introduction. So I'm very happy to be able to speak with you today. I was originally going to give this talk a year ago at the at the conference that was, of course, canceled just after the lockdown started last March, um, which meant I didn't have to create the talk at that time, which was great. Um, so I'm happy to be back and, and to give you this presentation now. And it has the advantage now of building off a, a couple of, of um, papers that we've published in the last um, four months on the topic of remaining carbon budgets. So <clears throat> I'm going to give you, a, you know, about a 40 minute or so um, overview of what is the remaining carbon budget um, how do we estimate it uh, what is it what does it mean and and what does it tell us about what needs to be done in order to meet um, the world's global climate targets so let's get started um, so i thought i'd start with a, a guided google search actually so this is a just to get a, a sense of, of how well Google understands the concept of the carbon budget, um, which is generally not a bad reflection of, of how uh, the world at large understands uh, scientific concepts. So, so here, if we do a Google search for the term carbon budget, um, the, the first link that comes up is you know fairly a decent actually definition of the remaining carbon budgets from a, 
a website called the Carbon Tracker Initiative. Um, and so it gives a you know, brief definition here. Carbon budget is the cumulative amount of carbon dioxide emissions permitted over a period of time. So those, you know, that is the, the primary idea. It's a total amount of CO2 emissions. Uh, so if we proceed down through the Google search a little bit, um, we get these frequently asked questions. Uh, if we look at the first one, um, carbon budget is a single number that encapsulates the finite limits of our planet's physical systems. That's good. Highlights the need to reach net zero, which is also uh, a, a good definition. Um, if we continue to release emissions on a net basis, the budget is breached and the temperature keeps rising. So, so far, so good. Um, another example down at the bottom, what is the 1.5 carbon budget? So this is actually from a post in the Carbon Brief, which is a, a pretty good source of, um, of uh, information about you know, current cl climate science. And it's in reference to the, the 1.5 degree IPCC report that came out in October, 2018. Uh, so again, a very you know good coherent de definition, uh, simplified way to measure the additional emissions that can be can enter the atmosphere if the world wishes to limit global warming to levels such as one and a half degrees. Um, so, okay, so these are the kind of the good definitions that we get. After that, it gets a little bit less um, less robust. This is not a bad definition. The carbon def budget is defined as a tolerable quantity of greenhouse gas emissions. So it's a little bit less specific. It's talking about greenhouse gases in general rather than just co2 and so that is a divergence from the, the actual science of the carbon budget and then if we get to this one then what are the five carbon budgets this is actually a very different concept it's a little bit confusing in relation to the other issues and this is in reference to um the the uk's uh five-year carbon budget system that they've set up in order to track their own domestic emissions and i, I will come back to this because this is you know it's actually quite common to here, carbon budgets brought up in reference to a particular country or even a particular city like Montreal's uh, emissions allowances. And so this is not quite the same thing. And, it, and there's actually quite a few steps to go from the, the idea of a global carbon budget to a, a national or a jurisdictional budget. Um, so I, I will get us there towards the end of the talk today. So finally, is the last um, piece of this, just to make an important distinction. So if you look at the, the second uh, hit that Google comes up with after this list of questions, this is from the Global Carbon Project, which every year uh, publishes what it calls the car uh, Global Carbon Budget. Um, now, this is uh, one of the unfortunate things about the, the field of carbon budget research is that there are two uh, different but equally scientifically recognized definitions of the global carbon budget. Um, one is what I've, I've explained so far, and the other is this, the, the kind of annual tracking of the sources and sinks of carbon in the atmosphere or in the, in the climate system. So we, we know how much CO2 that humans are emitting every year. We want to know where that CO2 ends up on an annual basis. Some of it obviously accumulates in the atmosphere. Um, other amounts go into the land and the ocean biosphere. So the Global Carbon Project publishes what they call a carbon budget every year to uh, track the flows of this uh, of carbon. And so, like I said, this is a scientifically correct use of the term carbon budget, but it's a different concept from the idea of total emissions associated with a given climate target. So, you know, about four months ago, we published this paper um, in Nature Geoscience, and this was coming out of a, a workshop that was organized a couple of years ago in Vancouver. Um, you know, most of the leading researchers uh, that work around issues of the carbon budget were there. And the first step was to formalize and agree on this definition of what is the remaining carbon budget. Um, so this is the definition that we present in the paper, the quantity of cumulative or total CO2 emissions that is consistent with limiting global mean warming to a given temperature level. level. Importantly, this is different from the what we're referring to as the historical global carbon budget, which is this annual um, assessment of the contemporary balance of sources and sinks of carbon in the Earth system. So then the remaining budget is just the amount that can still be emitted. So if we take off all of the emissions that have already been emitted to the atmosphere from the carbon budget, then we're left with the remaining carbon budget, which is what can be emitted still in the future if we want to meet our temperature target. Importantly, um, this refers to only CO2 emissions, either from fossil fuel combustion or land use change, up into the point in time that CO2 emissions reach net zero. So it's the total quantity of little positive uh, CO2 emissions into the atmosphere. 
and does not apply to other greenhouse gases. So scientifically is a concept that really only applies to CO2, carbon dioxide emissions by themselves and not other types of emissions that we put into the atmosphere. So it's a you know fairly straightforward concept. Um, you know, it's, it's very appealing in that way. It's easy for people to understand. Um, you, know, you can visualize it in this way over on the right if we have our global level of global warming on the vertical axis and there's a certain amount of warming that it's been caused in red already to date from the CO2 and everything else that we've already emitted. And then we have a certain amount of, of remaining warming until we get to this threshold, one and a half degrees. Um, so in order to estimate the remaining carbon budget, you, you do fundamentally need to separate the effect of CO2 from other greenhouse gases. And so you can kind of estimate the amount of future warming that's likely to be caused by non-CO2 emissions and then have some space of available warming to be caused by future CO2 emissions. And so that space defines the remaining carbon budget. And given that it's a you know, physical quantity, a finite quantity, and people often will display it as you know, some kind of circular rendition. Um, here's one that takes numbers from the IPCC report that came out in 2018, showing the amount of remaining emissions for three different levels of global warming. So 540 billion tons of emissions for one and a half degrees, 1,000 for 1.75, 1,400 for two degrees of global warming. Um, another representation here, um, you know, the other kind of appealing thing about this carbon budget idea is that it's quite easy to compare to, for example, the amount of carbon that's represented by the world's uh, reserves of fossil fuels. Um, and people have sometimes called this a, a carbon bubble, this idea that there's much, much more carbon currently stored in unburnt or unextracted um, oil, natural gas, and coal than there is in the remaining carbon budget for, for any of these global climate targets. Uh, so just to look at this a little bit closer. So over here on the left, this is a, a representation of the total amount of CO2 that we have emitted to date um, up to the year 2019. So 2,300 billion tons of CO2. And then these bars here give you a bit of an estimate of what the remaining carbon budget is for one and a half or well below two degrees, which are the two primary targets of the Paris Agreement. Um, and in comparison, this is the representation of how much carbon is available to be emitted were we to burn all current reserves of coal, oil, and natural gas. So, you know, about, you know, four or five times the available carbon budget, whereas these carbon budgets would cause one and a half to two degrees of warming above pre-industrial levels, burning the total available fossil fuel uh, reserve would cause something like four to eight degrees of additional future warming. Um, here's a nice, another nice animation that, that looks at the historical progression of CO2 emissions. Um, so you can see the, the date counter moving up at the top and then the colors are presenting the, where those emissions were produced. And so historically the US is the largest total emitter of CO2 followed by the EU and China. Um, and then, you know, given what has already been emitted, there is a finite amount of uh, space left in the bucket if we want to limit warming to one and a half degrees. And then finally, um, the visualization that I've been most closely involved with, uh, the climate clock that tracks or uses this idea of a, a finite uh, available carbon budget to project future emissions and estimate at what time in the future we would get to one and a half degrees if we continue to emit at the rate that we have been over the last five or ten years. So while not displayed explicitly here, the idea of the remaining carbon budget is is um, is behind the, the numbers that are displayed on on the on the climate clock. Um, the tons of CO2 emitted are down at the bottom and if we extrapolate that amount, uh, the rate of increase forward in time, we would get to the uh, end of the remaining carbon budget in a little bit less than 12 years at current emission rates. Okay, so that's the, what is a carbon budget. Um, so I wanna spend a little bit of time just explaining why scientifically this concept works as well as it does. And 
the fundamental reason why there is a carbon budget, why future emissions are are finite in the way that they are, is because every additional emission of CO2 that we emit causes temperature to increase further. And so there's actually a very coherent linear relationship between the total amount of CO2 that we emit over time on the bottom axis here and the temperature change that occurs in response to those emissions. And so this relationship is, is quantified by a metric called the TCR year, the transient climate response to cumulative CO2 emissions. And so I've displayed it here as a, as a, as a perfectly straight line. Um, it's not actually perfectly straight, but it's, it's very close to uh, being, being very straight. Um, of course, there's uncertainty associated with that uh, relationship. Um, and that uncertainty reflects the scientific understanding of how the climate system responds to CO2 emissions, both with respect to where the carbon goes after we emit it, and also with respect to how the physical climate system itself responds to the CO2 that accumulates in the atmosphere. And there's a number of kind of particularities in there that are, are, are relevant to this relationship, but by and large, the, the relationship between cumulative emissions and temperature change uh, holds uh, surprisingly well across a wide range of emission scenarios. So given this relationship, um, we can define our, our temperature limit and uh, use the, the line or the TCRE to estimate the budget, the total amount of CO2 emitted that would be consistent with that temperature limit. Um, with some, of course, uncertainty range reflecting that uh, scientific uncertainty. So you know, this is a very straightforward relationship. Um, I mean, it's not quite as simple as all of that. Um, there is this, you know, this is the world if, if CO2 was the only driver of climate change, which of course it's not. Um, and so we do have to account for the effect of other greenhouse gas emissions as well. Um, and so in general, those other emissions tend to produce additional warming. Um, and you know, they, whether they're methane being emitted uh, as a result of agriculture, nitrous oxide, um, the aerosols that are emitted in association with a lot of these greenhouse gases tend to have a cooling influence on climate. And one of the kind of uh, difficult uh, challenges associated with uh, climate mitigation is that as we decrease our emissions of CO2, those aerosol emissions will also decrease and might actually lead to additional warming. So the, the net effect of all of these things is to lead to more warming than what is caused by CO2 itself. And so we need to then factor that into our warming limit. And so if we have our actual temperature limit, which is higher than the temperature caused only by CO2 emissions, then again, we can define a, a budget and a range associated with that, that carbon budget using this relationship between cumulative emissions and temperature increase. So that's a kind of general schematic. I mean, this is what it looks like when we run an actual climate model. This is actually a quite a simple climate model. And so the, the lines are relatively straight, but you can see two plumes of, of dots here. One is a set of simulations where only CO2 is used to drive the, the climate model. The other is a set of simulations where CO2 and all the other things that we emit are used to drive the model. You can see more warming in the all emissions scenarios. And so if we take our one and a half degree temperature limit, find the midpoint of this plume of scenarios, go down to the bottom, that defines our best estimate from this model of the remaining carbon budget. Um, and, and so this would be the estimate of the, the total amount of CO2 emissions that would be associated with, with warming of one and a half degrees. Um, you know, given how much we've already emitted, which is 2000 or 2300 billion tons, we have a remaining carbon budget of about 500 billion tons with some uncertainty range around that. Um, so this, uh, this uncertainty range is reflecting this particular model, um, which is not the full assessment of uncertainty, but um, it does give you a sense of, of what this looks like. So I do realize that some people are putting questions into the Q&A, which are popping up into this in the corner of my eye, and I'm going to just ignore them for the moment and, and continue on. But I, I will come back to these questions. Um, in the discussion period at the end. <coughs> okay, so I want to actually talk now about this uncertainty range because that's a, a really important um, piece. In order for this concept to be of, of, a, of a carbon budget, which is you know very simple and relatively easy to understand, in order for it to be kind of relevant to policy, we need to be able to 
put likelihoods on the climate response to different levels of emissions. And so this uncertainty range is actually really key to the application of the carbon budget to any kind of reasonable climate policy response. So what are the types of uncertainty that, that affect this number? Um, so the first is what we would call geophysical uncertainty. So this is the uncertainty associated with our scientific understanding of the climate system, how the climate system responds to the emissions that we put into the atmosphere. So, you know, for reasonably straightforward, obviously very complex in, in lots of ways, but conceptually, you know, we don't, you know, we don't understand many things about the climate system precisely. And so we, we can quantify a, an uncertainty that's associated with that understanding. So if this was all it was actually, it would be a fairly straightforward process to quantify um, the uncertainty affecting carbon budget estimates. Unfortunately, it's not the only thing. And the other sources of uncertainty are a bit harder to deal with. So the first is what we would call socioeconomic uncertainty. Um, socioeconomic referring to human socioeconomic systems. And so this is relevant to carbon budgets because the carbon budgets actually do depend on what levels of other gases we emit. If we're very successful in mitigating uh, emissions of methane, for example, that would allow more warming to be caused by CO2 and would actually enlarge the, the carbon budget itself. Um, if we you know, if we're not successful in mitigating methane emissions, then the carbon budget gets correspondingly smaller. So, you know, these choices about what gases we choose to focus our effort on in terms of mitigation are actually one of the determinants of the carbon budget itself. And, and so this is things that affect future emissions pathways, reflect human decisions. They're actually not very easy or even potentially possible to quantify uh, probabilistically. And then there's methodolog methodological uncertainty. And you know, this, I'm calling this uncertainty, really it's, it's just methodological inconsistency across uh, different estimates of the carbon budget. So if we look at the, you know, the spread of estimates in the literature, a lot of the spread actually results or emerges from just different definitions of the carbon budget or different assumptions that are made among or by the researchers uh, among different studies. And so, you know, part of the reason why carbon budget estimates have ranged so widely to the literature is actually not for any good underlying scientific reason. It's just that we have been a little bit sloppy in our definitions over time. And then finally, there's this other thing, which I will again come to later in the talk. Um, if we want to talk about actually allocating carbon budget amounts to particular jurisdictions, be they countries or corporations or uh, cities, then there's a whole slew of other questions that need to be addressed in order to um, make that allocation in a way that is, is reasonable and, and is not um, and it's consistent with the overall budget. So just quickly some examples of these before I, I show you the analysis that, that we did. Um, you know, any process that affects the climate response to CO2 emissions, there's uncertainty associated with um, non-CO2 effects on the climate system. There's feedbacks that are not accounted for in climate models. There's potentially unrealized warming associated with emissions that are already in the atmosphere. And so these are kind of the, the scientific uncertainties that we want to get a handle on. Um, on the socioeconomic side, there's human choices and dynamics that affect, uh, primarily affect non-CO2 emissions need to be accounted for. And then there's kind of methodological choices. There's a couple of different ways you can define global temperature, for example, that make quite a big difference for the estimate of the remaining carbon budget. Um, there's an ongoing debate in the scientific community about what actually is pre-industrial and what time period should be used as the pre-industrial reference period. And so if we already warmed the climate system by 1.1 or 1.2 degrees, that 10th of a degree different is actually quite relevant to the remaining carbon budget and, and varies depending on how we define the pre-industrial period. Um, and then there's various other choices of, of what can be included or excluded in carbon budget estimates. <clears throat> so if we look to the IPCC special report on 1.5 degrees that came out in 2018, um, some of you may have, you know, encountered some of these numbers, um, particularly the ones over here, and this one, 420 uh, billion tons in particular, is a number that um, has been used quite a bit in popular discourse around um, what we need to do in order to limit warming to one and a half degrees. Um, you know, this number is also uh, somewhat 
related to the idea of having you know, 12 more years to save the climate, which is a phrase that got kicked around a lot after this report came out. Um, currently, we emit about 40 billion tons of CO2 each year. So this number 420 is about 10 years of current emissions. In any case, the, the, these numbers were, were published by the IPC as the kind of best estimate of the remaining carbon budget at the time. And you can see this range here that reflects um, uncertainty associated with the carbon budget. But then over here, a number of other numbers that represent additional uncertainty associated with the carbon budget. And so, you know, this number over here, and in particular this number 420 was said to be the, the amount of future emissions that would give us a 67% chance of limiting warming to one and a half degrees. But actually this only accounts for uncertainty associated with the CO2 or the climate response to CO2 emissions. And there's a whole other set of uncertain processes that were quantified separately or were not incorporated into this main estimate of, of the carbon budget. And then they were there, they were acknowledged, but you can see that the range here is actually about five times larger than the range associated with only the uncertainty that was represented on the left-hand side of this table. So, I mean, this was at the time, the, you know, a, a really important advance in terms of understanding the carbon budget and the sources of uncertainty, but the estimate of the carbon budget that they produced was only, uh, only reflected a subset of those uncertain processes. So if I go back to this list of examples of uncertain processes affecting the carbon budget, it was really only the first of these was, that was reflected in the primary numbers that the IPCC report gave us. And the rest of this was all what was called additional uncertainty. And so what I wanted to do then was to, you know, see if there was a way we, we could, you know, at least the, the first two sets of these, the geophysical and the socioeconomic uncertainty, uh, reflect those um, more fully in the primary estimate of the remaining carbon budget. And so I'm going to spend a few minutes now just on this other paper that we um, published about two months ago. Um, that again, the goal of this paper was to do just that: to, to take these sources of uncertainty that, as much as possible, and to to do a, a proper probabilistic estimate of the remaining carbon budget, accounting for those uncertain processes. And so in our in our approach, we we chose um, five different uh, parameters to, to focus on in terms of contributing to that uncertainty. So one is the amount of warming to date. Um, you know, obviously we have estimates of global temperature increase from the observational record, and there is uncertainty associated with those estimates. And so again, if warming has, uh, if we've already warmed the climate system by one or 1 1.2 degrees, I mean, that's about the range of uncertainty associated with observed warming and that that uncertainty is, is very relevant to how much warming remains until we get to one and a half degrees. The second piece of information is how much CO2 has already been emitted. Um, and again, there's good estimates and uncertainty associated with total historical CO2 emissions. And then third is this idea that, that CO2 is not the only driver of warming. We need to uh, account for the non-CO2 contribution to warming. And again, we can estimate that and we can estimate the uncertainty associated with that contribution. Um, those are the things that we can, the, those first three are the ones that can be observed and can be quantified based on a combination of actual observations and, and models. And then we have a couple of things that are, are unknown. And so in this case, you know, there is likely some additional future warming associated with emissions already in the atmosphere, or there may be. Um, we can estimate that using climate models and uh, incorporate that into our analysis. And then finally, we also want to know at the time that we get to one and a half degrees, um, how well have we done in terms of mitigating the non-CO2 emissions? And so the things like methane and nitrous oxide and aerosols that also contribute to climate changes and are very relevant to how much warming occurs over the next several decades. So if we can estimate these five quantities and their uncertainty, then we can estimate the remaining carbon budget itself. Um, and so this was our approach to take inputs uh, estimates and distributions for these five parameters, integrate them into a, uh, an equation and, and produce a, an estimate of the distribution of the remaining carbon budget. And so I'll show you the equation just because, um, oh, just because, I guess, no really good reason. Um, I'll just walk you through it quickly. Um, you know, it's not that complicated an equation. And as you can see, there's only five or so parameters. Um, 
So on the left is our remaining carbon budget. And then is walking through, there's actually only like three real terms in this equation. So again, first is the total historical CO2 that has already been emitted. Um, second is a series of temperature uh, variables. Um, and so T lim is the temperature limit we're interested in. So this, in this case would be one and a half degrees of warming above pre-industrial. T underscore ZEC is what I'm going to call the unrealized warming. So this is additional warming from the emissions that are already in the atmosphere. And so if we've already kind of baked in some amount of future emissions just by virtue of what is already there, obviously that would count against the available future warming for future emissions. And then, and then we have our, our observed temperature to date, um, anthropogenic warming to date. So this, this collection of temperature really tells us how much warming is there yet to occur before we get to our temperature target. And then finally over here is a set of terms that represents how much non-CO2 emissions are currently contributing to warming and how that will change in the future. So if the non-CO2 contribution to warming increases in the future, then that will decrease the carbon budget and vice versa. So again, if we estimate each of these terms, we can estimate the carbon budget. Um, so for our temperature limit, we have one and a half degrees. We can estimate anthropogenic warming to date and its uncertainty distribution, which looks something like that. The numbers are really teeny down at the bottom of the screen. You can probably see them, but it's not terribly important. Um, again, we can estimate the unrealized future warming from a set of appropriate model simulations. Uh, we can estimate the total historical emissions from inventory records for, for CO2 going back 150 years. And then we can also estimate the um, extent to which uh, non-CO2 uh, emissions contribute to warming. Okay, so this is our, this is our equation, it's our framework, and this is the result that we get when we uh, run all of those distributions through the equation and come up with uh, an estimate of the carbon budget itself. Um, so it looks like this, there's quite a, quite a big range um, that ranges actually from negative values to very large values. Negative values, you know, implying that there's actually a reasonable likelihood that the one and a half degree carbon budget has already been emitted. Um, and in this case, you know, if we're unlucky and in this sort of very sensitive part of the, the distribution, um, that means that, you know, regardless of what we do in future emissions, the, the 1.5 degree target will be breached at some point. Um, so our, our best estimate is not that. Our central estimate is that we still have um, 440 billion tons of CO2 available to emit in order to limit warming to one and a half degrees. Um, but again, this five to 95 percent range is is quite large. So it is large, but um, you know this is like the first time that really that all of these uncertain processes have been have been formally wrapped into a distribution of the remaining carbon budget. And so we can talk about our median estimate. And so if we were to emit 440 billion tons of CO2 from this year onwards, or from last year onwards, actually, um, we would lim we would have a one in two chance or a 50% chance of not exceeding one and a half degrees. If we were to want to increase that chance of not exceeding 1.5 degrees to 67% or a two in three chance, then we would be allowed to emit about five more years of current emissions. Okay, so this is the geophysical uncertainty. So again, all of these processes that I've described so far are, you know, uncertainties associated with our scientific understanding of the climate system. Um, I haven't yet talked about this idea of socioeconomic uncertainty, which affects the future emissions themselves. And so this distribution that can be quantified probabilistically only includes the geophysical uncertainty. If we want to also include the socioeconomic uncertainty, we have to do something a little bit different. Um, you know, because this uncertainty reflects human choices and, you know, potentially the actions of individuals in the human systems, um, it's not well suited to being quantified likelihood. It's very difficult to assign a likelihood of uh, any kind of likelihood to, to particular things happening uh, that involve particular individuals or particular countries. But we can look at scenarios and, um, define a range of, of what is plausible or what is possible. And when we do that, again, this really has to do with what, you know, to what extent 
humans are successful in mitigating future uh, non-CO2 emissions. And so if we look at the range of available scenarios, we can define a range of potential future carbon budgets. Um, you know, if humanity is successful or more successful in mitigating non-CO2 emissions, then that would shift the distribution of the remaining carbon budget upwards. Um, and if humanity is less successful in mitigating non-CO2 emissions, that would shift the budget downwards. And so there's this kind of trade-off between CO2 versus other types of, of greenhouse gases. Um, you know, there's a limited amount we can emit. And if we emit more of one, we have to emit less of the other. And so this, this scenario uncertainty or socioeconomic uncertainty has the effect of shifting the remaining carbon budget um, in either direction by 170 billion tons of CO2, which is about equal to four years of current CO2 emissions. So it's a fairly considerable um, shift uh, that you know, really speaks to kind of the, the ability of, for humans to, or for humanity to, to make decisions that affect the, the size of the remaining carbon budget. Okay, so to summarize these, these numbers then, our best estimate um, of the remaining carbon budget for one and a half degrees is 440 billion tons of CO2, which is about 10 years of present day current emission levels. Um, looking at the, only the geophysical uncertainty, we can define these ranges that give us a better or worse chance of not exceeding one and a half degrees. And then can also say that depending on what we decide to do or how successful we are with other types of emissions that, that carbon budget could either be enlarged or decreased by you know, a reasonably large amount. Um, you know, I haven't talked about methodological uncertainty in this analysis other than to say that throughout this, this framework, we, we were very careful to state all of our choices clearly and that the framework can actually fairly easily accommodate new understanding as well as different assumptions about different uh, important parameters. Okay, so that's, that's all I'm gonna to say about the kind of the actual science of the carbon budget. I, I wanna talk for the last five or 10 minutes about what we should take away from this in terms of um, what it means for, for climate policy going forward. Um, you know, most of climate policy is oriented around the Paris Agreement right now, which is that we have a primary global goal of limiting warming to well below two degrees. And interestingly, this well below two degrees often gets truncated to mean two degrees, which is not the same thing. I mean, it's pretty clear that well, do, well below two degrees is not well defined, but that two is not the same as well below two. So I think it is important to retain that well below um, phrasing when we're thinking about the goal of the Paris Agreement. So maybe that's 1.7, 1.8, 1.6, um, but it's something less than two in any case. And then we want to pursue efforts to limit temperature increase to one and a half degrees um, by the year 2100. So this is the, you know, the, the goal. This is what temperature has done so far. Um, global temperature has increased steadily over the last 150 years, particularly in the last 50 years. Um, according to this particular data set, you know, we're in the vicinity of 1.2 degrees above um, temperatures in the late 19th century. Um, and I did discover that Keynote has a, has a nice little COVID um, symbol built into their uh, symbol library, which I stuck on at the end just for fun. Um, so, you know, if we look at where emissions are going, and, and this is another very good website called the climateactiontracker.org, um, which has this nice graphic, their global temperature thermometer. Um, so here we are at present day, the amount of warming to date. Here's the lower end of the Paris Agreement goal. And then they give various estimates of where temperatures are likely to go if certain conditions are met. So if we look at the current national targets that have been submitted, formally submitted to the Paris Agreement. Um, those, if all of those targets were met, the, um, this analysis suggests that temperatures would increase by 2.6 degrees on average, potentially as high as 3.3 or as low as 2.1. Um, if, if we look only at the, the current policies that are in place in different countries, obviously this is a rapidly moving target, um, but you know, this suggests that those policies are not actually sufficient yet to meet all of the targets that are in place and would, and, you know, if no more policies were put in place, um, we would be looking at warming approaching three degrees. 
you know, recently uh, a lot of countries have actually been talking about more ambitious targets. China, for example, has announced the intention of a net zero target by 2060. Um, Canada and the US are both now also talking about net zero targets by 2050. So if all of these more optimistic targets were again, put in place, agreed to and actually met, that might bring warming down to 2.1 degrees of, of uh, above pre-industrial. So, you know, we're actually moving in the right direction. Um, a year ago, all of these numbers were, were uh, quite a bit higher. Um, but we're not yet in the kind of 1.5 to well below two degree range of the, of the Paris Agreement goal. Um, this website also gives you a sense of which countries are doing well and which ones are not. Um, you know, by and large, most of the world is not doing terribly well according to their analysis, at least most of the major emitters. Um, and so most of the major emitting countries, Canada, Europe, Brazil, Australia, um, China are in the kind of insufficient to highly insufficient in terms of their own national targets. So this is insufficient to meet the goals of the Paris Agreement. So you know, pretty much consistent with the previous um, plot. And then there's certain countries that are critically insufficient. Um, I'm not, I don't think this particular plot has been updated since the last US election. So some of these, again, these colors do change uh, quite frequently. Um, importantly also, a number of countries are increasing the ambition of their climate targets. And this website also gives you a sense of which countries have submitted stronger targets relative to the targets that were originally submitted five years ago. Um, so the green countries here are the ones that have submitted um, stronger uh, national emissions targets. Um, the red ones are ones that have submitted new target targets but did not increase their the ambition of their targets. And then many countries, of course, have not yet submitted. Um, so this, this website will um, evolve rapidly as we approach the next COP in at the end of this year, which is uh, five years after the Paris Agreement and is meant to be the first um, assessment of to what extent, or formal assessment of to what extent global targets are consistent with the goals of the Paris Agreement. But you know, one of the fundamental requirements of the carbon budget itself is that we need to achieve net zero emissions, and and this idea is also gaining momentum around the world. Um, you know, as of October 2020, you know. 826 cities, 100 regions, 1,500 companies have all had all announced their own version of some kind of net zero target, and so this is really important because it it does suggest that that the idea of a finite amount of future emissions is is starting to be felt within the, the climate policy community. So net zero CO2 emissions is is sort of the fundamental requirement of staying within a carbon budget. You know, the very important question of when we need to achieve that, um, you know, again, you know, it's very common to hear discussion of the idea of, of a national or a jurisdictional carbon budget in, in the media. And, and so we need to be able to get from this idea of a global budget to a national budget. Um, in order to do that, you need to do two things. One, you have to take the global budget, which is a total amount that says nothing about you know, when those emissions are actually produced and disaggregate that over time. Um, secondly, we need to disaggregate among countries. So I'll start with the first of these because that's kind of the easier one. Um, if we take our numbers for 1.5 degrees or two degree budget and start from present day emissions and scale down to zero in a linear fashion, our 1.5 degree budget estimate gets to uh, zero emissions by the year 2040, so in 20 years. Um, the well below two degree budget gets to net zero emissions uh, by the year 2060. And so you could adopt a scenario like this and then take each of these five year periods and say, okay, for the next five years, given this overall declining emissions trajectory, we have a five year budget that we can apply to the world as a whole. And so this, this is a mechanism that you can kind of track how the world is doing in terms of emissions um, on a something like a five-year reporting timescale. And this is in fact exactly what the UK has done in their national budget implementation is to define a series of five-year periods and to produce uh, a budget estimate for each of those five years using a scenario where UK emissions track downwards towards zero the year 2050. Um, 
So the, the UK actually has a very good example of how you might do this that other countries could quite easily adopt and, and follow in a similar manner. But then there is the more difficult question of how you might allocate the global budget to individual countries. And this becomes you know, less of a scientific question and more of a, of a subjective or ethical question because it does raise these questions of what is fair and what individual countries should be doing given you know, some principles of equality, which are generally seen as important given different responsibility for historical emissions and also different capability or ability to actually decrease emissions over time. Um, <clears throat> and so if we take this global remaining budget, disaggregate it to countries, you know, using some set of these principles, there's a, you know, a very large number of ways you could choose to apply these principles that could give you a very wide, widely ranging uh, national allocation. Um, but one, you know, one base principle is that um, you know, if we have our targeted base year for a, or targeted so net zero year for a particular uh, climate target, if the whole world has to get to that level by the year 2060, given these fairness principles, you know, there are certain countries that should be moving faster than others. And those countries are the ones that are more responsible and more capable in terms of wealth and resources to decrease those emissions faster. So, you know, looking at the 1.5 degree target, you know, obviously Canada is a, is a highly responsible, highly capable country. And we should be, you know, if we want to align our domestic net zero target with the 1.5 global budget, we need to be targeting net zero emissions before the year 2040. Now, just in the last few minutes, I, I do wanna talk about the effect of COVID because you know, obviously COVID is affecting all of our lives quite strongly right now and um, are you know, notably also affecting the level of fossil fuel CO2 emissions. Um, in the year 2020, uh, global emissions dropped by uh, 7% relative to 2019 as a result of the, the lockdowns that, are, that occurred. And you know, if you look at the time series of emissions, of CO2 emissions and all the various events that have occurred along the way, you know, from the oil crisis to the collapse of the Soviet Union to the global financial crisis, these are kind of the, the main points in time where emissions did decrease for a period of time. The, the financial crisis in 2008, emissions dropped by about 1.5% and then rebounded immediately the year after that. Um, and so here we are with, with you know, the single largest annual decrease in emissions in the, in the history of, of, well, the history of the world. Um, and I mean, it's unlikely that they're gonna rebound uh, fully uh, in 2021, although there is evidence that they are rebounding to some extent. Um, you know, where did this come from? Largely from decreases in surface transportation. So this green bar here is the largest um, contribution to that uh, decrease. This is the time series of, of the year 2020, um, showing daily emissions uh, relative to the same period in 2019. So at the peak of lockdowns, emissions had decreased by about um, 17, 18% relative to the same time period in 2019. Um, you know, interestingly, they are kind of still so re emissions rebounded from that lockdown and are now sort of trending downwards again relative to, to 2019. Um, you know, that downward trend is mostly occurring in high impact countries and upper middle income countries. And so this kind of it speaks to you know, the really important decisions that need to be made. Um, yeah, maybe just to, to point out quickly that if we look at how emissions had been changing in different uh, income level countries over the last five years. Um, these are the high income countries. So actually most of the high income countries in the world have had decreasing emissions over the last, um, over the five years previous to the COVID, um, the COVID effect. Unfortunately, Canada was not uh, one of those groups and Canada has not been doing as well as, as many other um, high income countries in terms of decreasing our domestic emissions. So, you know, this idea that emissions have gone down by 7%, you know, if this trend were to continue, um, you know, we would actually be, you know, smack on the kind of trajectory that we would need in order to limit warming to one and a half degrees. Um, you know, the projection for, you know, if we were to just go straight back to 
um, policies that were in place before COVID, as if nothing had happened, <clears throat> you know, the emissions would be expected to rebound and continue upwards. And so the really important question right now is if we can um, kind of direct government investments right now towards uh, continuing that decrease in emissions and, you know, potentially following one of these pathways that would allow us to meet our global climate targets. And so this is, you know, a similar analysis again from the, the Climate Action Tracker website, you know, to what extent can green stimulus packages close these gaps? And, you know, there, there is evidence that there's lots of money out there and there's certainly lots of money being spent right now on, you know, admittedly very important things. Um, but if you compare the global total um, COVID stimulus money that's being spent by governments to estimates of how much money would need to be spent in order to transform our energy infrastructure into renewable energies, there's actually more than enough money on the table. And, and so if governments choose to direct that money, some of that money towards um, decarbonization efforts, there's actually quite good potential to, to build on the momentum of the last year and continue the downward trend in global CO2 emissions. Um, I mean, there's just, there's, you know, obviously a lot of people are thinking about this and talking about it. <clears throat> this is an analysis that kind of looks at the relative greenness of different stimulus packages around the world. And obviously they vary considerably from Russia over here on the left, which is pretty much entirely not green to Denmark over here on the right, which is uh, according to this analysis doing the best job of, of targeting their um, stimulus money towards uh, green transitions. <clears throat> so just to, to wrap up, um, these are remaining carbon budgets are you know, a very simple concept. They're quite easy to understand. They're also quite easy to misinterpret. Um, they are fundamentally a finite cap on future allowable emissions that will require global and national net zero targets in order to not exceed. Um, you know, the, the difficult thing is that national targets do require consideration of fairness, fairness principles, which are um, objectively impossible to, to implement. Um, the idea of geophysical uncertainty is very important as a contributor to uncertainty in carbon budget estimates, um, but importantly, that these estimates are also sensitive to human decisions, which makes them even more difficult to quantify. So we, we did a new estimate that, that gave um, our estimate of carbon budgets, and there are obviously other estimates in the literature, but you know, by and large, in order to limit warming to one and a half degrees, we have about 10 more years at present day emission levels, which if we were to start um, or continually decreasing emissions along the lines that they have over the last year, that would give us 20 years to get to net zero and still have a reasonable chance of staying below one and a half degrees. And so this question of what we choose to do with COVID spending is really paramount as to um, whether we will retain a chance of meeting these targets or put them effectively out of reach. So thank you. Um, I'm happy to take some of the questions now. Thank you, Damon. It was fantastic. We have a, a number of questions. Let me just say, I really appreciate that excellent talk. It's kind of like a model of how, how to do science. You know, several clear definitions, you lay bare the logic, the equations, the, <clears throat> the models, the uncertainties. It's really nice to see. Um, let me go into the Q&A. Uh, there are some really interesting questions here. Uh, first question is about, can you do, talk about carbon neutrality versus climate neutrality, that term? We hear that a bit. Yeah, I mean, so I would, I would assume that climate neutrality refers to, okay, I guess I'm not really sure what, how I would define climate neutrality. If we define that as, a state where temperatures are stable, um, then then actually carbon neutrality and climate neutrality can be seen as synonymous in that if we are able to get to a level where we are not either not emitting CO2 emissions anymore or any emissions that we are producing are being matched by direct intentional withdrawals of CO2 from the atmosphere, so that would be carbon neutrality. Um, you know, in that scenario, I would say that global temperatures should also be approximately stable. Um, 
but I mean, I think there probably are other ways of defining climate neutrality, and 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 so that is a, a broader concept that um, that could diverge from the idea of carbon neutrality. But but fundamentally and scientifically, they are uh, pretty well linked. I would say. Great, thank you. Um, your colleague Jochen had a question about uh, for the target of 1.5 degrees, what <laughs> concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere would that correspond to, given that we're already at 418 parts per million? Is there a direct comparison there? So that question is wrapped up in uh, a time, I mean, there's a time scale associated with the answer. So if you know, if we were to, you know, decrease emissions, you know, exactly to the level that would stabilize concentrations in the atmosphere at 400, let's say 420 parts per million, which is close to where we are now. Um, you know, because of the lagged response between concentrations in the atmosphere and temperature, temperatures would continue to warm and would, you know, in you know, almost certainly exceed one and a half degrees within let's say two or three decades. So um, <clears throat> so in that sense, you know, the level of CO2 in the atmosphere, if it stays where it is today, is enough to get us past one and a half degrees. However, if we were to actually decrease emissions rapidly to zero, um, at some point, those levels of, uh, of atmospheric CO2 would start to drop. And so we might, you know, in that scenario, peak at 430 or even 440 parts per million but then those concentrations would decrease over time. And because of the lagged temperature response to those concentrations, you know, we may or may not actually exceed one and a half degrees. So, you know, there's a difference between, you know, a stable level of, of 420 parts per million would be enough to eventually cause temperatures to increase above one and a half degrees, but a, a peak of 430 followed by declining CO2, um, you know, might, might not, uh, lead to temperatures uh, in excess of one, one and a half degrees. Great, thank you. I have a series of questions. Of, um, don't the SSP pathways take the socioeconomic uncertainties you speak of into account? <clears throat> These are a couple of technical uh, questions. <clears throat> yeah, no, they do in the sense that the those SSP pathways are kind of design, designed and created to try to span the range of potential future scenarios, potential future mitigation decisions. And so, so, so yes, you know, our, our definition of socioeconomic uncertainty is drawn from that set of scenarios and the range of those scenarios. And we use those scenarios actually to, to quantify that socioeconomic uncertainty. Um, you know, the reason why this isn't always factored into carbon budget estimates is because it's quite common actually for modelers to choose one future scenario as the kind of basis for their estimate of the remaining carbon budget. You know, previously it would have been, let's say RCP 2.6, which is the most ambitious mitigation scenario in the previous generation of scenarios. And so if you base all of your calculations around RCP 2.6, that is one set of socioeconomic assumptions that does not reflect the full set of potential uh, socioeconomic uncertainty. But certainly if you do include the full scenario set and particularly the full scenario set, of scenarios that do get to net zero CO2 emissions, then you would do a reasonable job of sampling that socioeconomic concern. Okay, great. So, so I think I'll, I'll alternate here. Um, uh, here's a more general question. Well, I guess, can 170 gigatons, I guess gigaton, uncertainty from non-CO2 emissions be broadly interpreted that a much larger part, i.e. 20 to 30% of the public climate conversation should focus on non-CO2 emissions? Currently, these emissions seem to be largely overlooked. I mean, I'd say yes and no to that particular question because you know that plus or minus 170 gigatons uncertainty is kind of irrelevant if we don't succeed in limit in driving CO2 emissions down to zero. So, okay. you know, if you know all of this is based on the fundamental assumption that that we make an attempt to mitigate CO2 emissions and that we are successful in mitigating those emissions and getting them down to zero. If we don't, then we're going to exceed 1.5 degrees no matter what we do with all the other gases. So okay. you know, fundamentally, CO2 is the most important variable. But you know, if we are able to solve the CO2 problem, then the, then the decisions about the other gases become very important um, and can either you know, make that challenge even harder or give us a little bit more space to maneuver. Great, 
Damon, are you able to stay on a bit after 3.30? We yeah, have, yeah. okay, well, there's yeah. a lot of interest here. Here's a very specific one. Uh, why does your latest paper focus on 2040 as the target date for net zero when the SSP1 1.9 pathway, for example, doesn't call for it until 2056? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, that's because the SSP1 pathway assumes that at some point in the future, we will develop the ability to extract CO2 from the atmosphere. And so that scenario, which gets to net zero emissions by 2050, then progresses to negative emissions after that date. Um, and so, so in order to, so, so in that scenario, we will have kind of emitted more than the remaining carbon budget for one and a half degrees and then spend several decades trying to extract that CO2 back out of the atmosphere using some form of technolo technology, uh, typically assuming some form of biomass energy combined with carbon capture and sequestration. And so aggregated over the entire 21st century, you have kind of net CO2 emissions that resemble the one and a half degree budget, which is why it's called a 1.5 degree scenario. But that, um, but we actually over emit that budget over the next few years, and then have to kind of crawl back from that in the latter half of the century. So, so the reason our our budget estimate gets you know zero emissions at 2040 is because it does not you know if we if we actually got to zero emissions at 2040, then we would not have to rely on negative emissions in order to um, you know claw back some of that excess CO2. Okay, that's great. All right, now we have, well, we may have an election coming soon. So always, I'm sure your favorite questions. What is the best route for engaging with politicians about this issue? It feels many times like no matter how dire the situation gets, jobs in the economy always seem to come first. We always hear that coming out of the pandemic. Coming from Alberta originally, the questioner says, I see this time and time again. Yeah. Um... So I heard actually quite an interesting quote on CBC Ideas the other day. There's a um, there's a program. I think the program was called the the Forever Protest. It was talking about the history of environmental protest and you know around the world. But um, there was some quote that I'll get somewhat wrong, but it was something to the effect of governments don't governments don't make change. Governments respond to change. Um, and so the context of this quote was you know therefore. If you want to make change, your conversation has to be with the, the people, not with the government. Um, and so I'd say the best way, I mean, it's, it's, that did kind of resonate with me. I think the best way to actually engage with governments is to build public support for climate action. And that if public support for climate action gets to a certain level, then governments will feel empowered to take that action. And I mean, I do think I mean, it's a bit unfair to put all of the resistance to government action on Alberta, but we do have a circumstance in Canada where there's kind of a very strong voting bloc in Alberta that is has traditionally been opposed to any kind of climate action and it has made federal climate ambition very difficult to, to implement. And okay. if we could get to a point where the, the entire country is is on board with the need to implement ambitious climate action policies and then that would yeah that would you know give governments the political leeway to do that in, in a way that we haven't seen so far excellent here's a question about um it seems that polar ice and permafrost are melting faster than most estimates although your new carbon budget ranges take geophysical and socioeconomic uncertainties into account given the very large uncertainty associated with feedback loops and tipping points would it be reasonable to recommend the consistent use of the lower range of the carbon budget in policy making? When would net zero need to be reached to be consistent with that lower range? Yeah. Um, you know, by 2030 instead of 2040, let's say, mm -hmm. uh, for a 1.5 degree scenario. So, I mean, yes, if, if you want to um, leave more room for the types of uncertainties that could cause more warming than we expect, then we would need to target a smaller carbon budget. Um, so, I mean, you know, politically, I, you know, there's always a balance between, you know, what is, yeah, what is possible to achieve and, and what we want to push for. Um, 
and I, I guess I don't really know the answer to that, but you know, scientifically, sure. you know, our net zero by 2040 number gives us a one in two chance of not exceeding one and a half degrees. It doesn't mean we're gonna like if we get there. You know, it's very unlikely that we would exceed two degrees. So we would, you know, if we if we do manage to get to net zero by 2040, you know, we would, you know, best estimate warming would be one and a half degrees. You know the range around that, you know, might go up to 1.7, 1.8 degrees. So we would still be in the kind of well below two degree range um, at that emissions level. But if we want a better chance of actually not exceeding one and a half degrees, then we need to get to net zero sooner. Okay. Uh, I, I was impressed to like this question or was with the UK's uh, determining their carbon budget. How does a country that has an oil producer like the UK uh, what's the secret to their su success and how can other countries follow suit? Are resources readily available for other jurisdictions to learn from their experience and adapt it for themselves? Is that a model for Canada or is it unrealistic, do you think? I mean, I don't see why not. I mean, the, so the UK put together a, um, you know, independent committee on climate change that was kind of that basically developed the system and and you know was able to have the government um, adopt it and that I mean that committee is made up of people who understand the science of carbon budgets very well um, and so so it is you know it's not surprising that the the scientific coherency of that policy is quite strong um, so I mean yes you know if you were to populate a you know, an independent advisory committee to the federal government that actually had some yeah. power and the authority with, you know, not just scientists, because there are other, you know, sources of expertise that are also important, but with, you know, with people who could actually, you know, come up with the system that would, that would go a long way in Canada. Um, you know, I will say that the, the UK's carbon budget, you know, it is a good model. It's not a 1.5 degree climate policy. Um, you know, it, you know, this net zero by 2050 for a country like the UK is, you know, it's a reasonable target for a two degree climate scenario, maybe even for a well degree, well below two degree climate scenario, um, but it's not in line with a 1.5 degree carbon budget. Excellent. Here's a question about cities. Given that cities often act as policy laboratories, what potential do you see for carbon budgets at the municipal level to iron out logistical and methodological challenges for subsequent application at provincial and federal levels. Mm -hmm. I mean, a lot of cities are talking about carbon budgets and about net zero targets. And so, I mean, I think the more cities adopt the idea of a net zero target, um, I mean, the more federal governments will also be able to, to do the same. Um, so I think it is an important uh, part of the conversation. I, I think also just the idea of Kind of budgeting and reporting on carbon emissions at regular intervals is an important political conversation, and and so I mean this is the other way that carbon budgets can contrib contribute to the discourse is just by kind of you know, institutionalizing them within government frameworks and policy. You know, if every year we had a carbon budget that was released at the same time as the fiscal budget, that would that would embed the climate conversation mm -hmm. in a very tangible way. Yeah, excellent. Excellent. Uh, question, what do you see as the biggest risk to the credibility of the IPCC? How can faith be built in multilateral institutions within democratic societies that are accustomed to having their cake and eating it too? Um, <clears throat> I mean, I think fundamentally the biggest risk to the credibility of the IPCC is all the climate deniers who are mm -hmm. actively trying to undermine everything the IPCC says. Um, I mean, as an institution, the IPCC is, has been quite remarkable in its uh, ability to kind of synthesize the science of climate change at five-year intervals over the last three decades. Um, I mean, it's a very interesting and important process, I would say. Um, you know, there is a there is a very strong push within the IPCC to kind of inform policy, but not try to prescribe policy. Um, and and that is a line that the IPCC has tried very hard not to cross over the years, you know, to kind of present the information, but not to try to tell governments what they should do with that information. But as a as an independent scientific body, kind of providing information to governments, they've been very successful in, in doing that. Okay, excellent. I, I really liked your idea about the governments responding to change. So, 
you know, we may have an election soon. Are there a couple of policies that we should coalesce behind um, to force national parties to get on board? I mean, what do you look for as an elector? Um, yeah, I mean, I think there are a lot of important policies, um, you know, strictly with respect to climate targets, you know, net zero emissions, you know, within the next couple decades, I think is really important. Um, so the federal government has kind of floated this idea of a net zero by 2050 target. Um, I mean, it's a good start. And again, is, you know, not badly aligned with the kind of upper end of the Paris Agreement temperature goals. Um, you know, if we want to be serious about contributing to a 1.5 degree mitigation effort, we need to push that date even sooner. Um, okay. So I mean, I think we could push governments to push, push the federal government to um, kind of roll that date even closer um, in terms of the, the net zero date. Um, but I mean, there's lots of other important issues as well. I think, you know, social and climate justice is, is um, you know, fundamentally important as well for, for governments to, to speak to and to implement policies to kind of both like increase resilience in, in vulnerable communities and also kind of deal with the inequality issues that are plaguing the world um, and also being amplified by, by COVID. Eamon, thank you for staying so long past the, the time we asked you to because there have been so many questions. Uh, Rebecca, I know, wanted to remind people of something. Yeah, thank you, Damon, for a really wonderful, informative talk. I always learn so much. Um, I wanted to thank the audience as well and for space um, and also just remind everybody that this is the first day of our week of conversations uh, in half an hour, a little bit more, half an hour, 49 minutes. <laughs> we will be back here um, to speak with Daniel Horan Greenford and, uh, and Andrews Bjorn, who are both doing work with Damon Matthews um, about, and they will be talking about science-based uh, targets and about capitalism in the transition. Uh, we will have uh, Angela Carter coming on Wednesday who will speak about the Keep It in the Ground movement. So do join us then. Tomorrow at noon, we will be talking about Concordia's climate action plan. Uh, and the whole rest of the week, we have four events a day. So please um, do come back and join us. And I'll leave it to you, Jim, to wrap us up. Well, thank you. Thanks very much, Damon, for really highlighting our first day of our conference. And I guess I should return it to Anna. Which is volleying the microphone back and forth. I love it. Uh, yes, <laughs> thank you so much, everyone. Uh, thanks for attending, Damon. That was wonderful. Thank you so much for staying and taking the extra questions. We really appreciate it. I'll just remind folks that we have recorded this talk. If you missed it, I'll uh, email out the link to the registrants, and then you can share it with your classes and your children and anybody who you want to share it with. On that note, we're closing up shop here, folks, and we'll see you at the next event. Thanks very much. Have a great evening. Bye. Thanks, Damon.